you are listening to The J-Boy Show, your number one source for Auburn and the SEC. My goal was to run through his soul and grab his heart when I, when I run through his soul. Kurt, Nate, Coach Dad. Those are memories. memories. I think we've established ourselves as, I think, the premier conference in college football. College football. Now, the SEC is, is, is better at the top. It's better in the middle. It's- the Southeastern Conference remains the premier conference. Yeah. and everybody else trying to catch it. I think this is probably the best league from a competitive venue standpoint. And they have the most capable team. You just look at those programs, the way they recruit, how they invest. Snap to Burrow. Three steps. Fires. Back corner of the end zone. Over the shoulder. Catch. Did he hold on? Now, your host, J-Boy. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us on another special edition. I, you know, I, I treat every show the same. I love every show, but this one's extra special to me. I'm going to get to our guest in a moment. Obviously, you're going to know him, and I'm very excited to get him in here and, and pick his brain and, and get some old stories that I'm sure you guys will enjoy. Uh, but before I do, I want to talk about betonline.ag for one second, one of our sponsors. Uh, college football's over. The NFL's over but everything's not over. The online casino is open 24 seven. We got college baseball coming, major league baseball, March madness, which is one of the most bet things on the planet, wagers, props, all types of stuff. So make sure you head over to betonline.ag today. They got unbelievable sign up bonuses. You're always going to get the best spreads you want. And again, if you're a guy that likes to do props and stuff like that, they got more props than a Hollywood movie set. So go over to betonline.ag and check them out. Tell them Jay boy sent you, but our guest today, moving on is Pat Dye Jr., uh, a guy that has been unbelievably successful, one of the top agents, sports agents in the country, has carved out a huge slice uh, in that world because he's a genuine guy, just like his father, a guy you may know, coached in the SEC a little bit. Uh, You may know him from Auburn and Pat Dye. And uh, Pat Jr., I really appreciate you coming on. It's an honor to have you on the show. Jake, it's great to be with you. Um, Obviously, we have a long family history there. (laughs) I feel like I'm talking to... (laughs) <laughs> uh, your dad, my former client, my first client. So mm-hmm. uh, it's, a, it's remarkable how you how much you guys look alike. Yeah, you know, he, he always said he marked us up pretty good, good, bad, or indifferent. <laughs> he used to apologize all the time. But no, I, I appreciate that. And, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank you for what your family uh, has done for mine and what your dad did for my dad. And, and you talk about him being your first client, obviously, as an agent. But, you know, growing up, had it, and, and it's something where I feel like we almost – had the same childhood because every life lesson I was told, if I screwed up or my dad really wanted to get something across to me, it tended to always start with Coach Dye used to say. And he told me, I want to raise you the way that Coach Dye raised me at Auburn. And that's something that is not just shared by my dad. And, and every player that played for Pat Dye, you know, he used to say he, he knew what made him laugh. He knew what made him cry. He knew who he really was. And can you just talk about for a second, and, and I know uh, obviously his passing, you know, somewhat recently affected all of us, uh, but the memory and legacy he left will live on way past any of us. Can you just talk about being the son of Pat Dye and growing up and, and being able to, to watch what he did? Yeah, so um, I would start by saying that, that he, he was a great dad um, mm-hmm. to me. And unlike some of my younger siblings, when, when I was growing up, dad was an assistant coach, you know, with yeah. coach Brian at Alabama for nine years. And uh, we moved to Tuscaloosa when I was three and left when I was 12 and he was head coach at East Carolina. And yeah, being a head coach is more demanding than being an assistant coach, but being the head coach at East Carolina was obviously not near as demanding as being the head coach at Auburn. So the point of all that is he actually had time for me, you yeah. know, time to take me hunting, fishing, playing golf, um, you know, I would, I would jump in the car with him. This is back before everybody had, you know, school jets and stuff to jet around. Um, he'd drive a lot of places. I'd jump in the car with him and, you know, ride from Greenville, North Carolina to Raleigh to see a high school, high school football game because I knew I was going to have that, you know, hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes going to the game with him. I enjoyed watching the games and then an hour and 45 minutes going home with him. And just, you know, having that father-son time. So, uh, again, 
when he became head coach at Auburn and my younger siblings were in their formative ages, he didn't have as much time to, to be a dad. But yeah, I also learned a lot about him um, and life and the things that he would want to instill in a son by listening to him talk to his team mm-hmm. and, and, and players and the importance of hard work, sacrifice, self-discipline you know, uh, physical toughness, emotional toughness, um, you know, all pulling on the same end of the rope, teamwork, playing with one heartbeat, all those things. And that's why I think he had the ability, you know, to get a guy like Bo Jackson, who I know I'm biased, but I think is the greatest athlete of our lifetime mm-hmm. to mesh and meld with a guy like Randy Campbell, who weighed 165 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> probably wasn't even the best athlete on his high school football team, but they would come together and, and won championships. And uh, it, that was, um, it, that was really, really cool as a son watching your father impact, not hundreds of lives, but thousands of lives of, of young men that, you know, that he coached at Alabama for nine years, or he coached East Carolina for six years, or he coached at Auburn for 12 years. And, and uh, even when he, retired just being over at Auburn being over at their practices I mean right up until you know 2020 when he passed away I mean he had a a, just a very very unique way and bond with those young men here he is 80 some of these guys are 17 18 19 years old but he could talk to them he could be candid with them he could be direct with them he could be honest with them and do it in such a disarming way that they wouldn't get their feelings hurt. They wouldn't get their back up and they would take it as constructive criticism. And I'd sit there and watch them again, 18, 19 year olds from all walks of life, black, white, rich, poor, whatever, hanging on every word. Yeah. uh, So that was, that was cool. And, um, you know, Bo Jackson, you know, said something really, really nice uh, at the, at the, we had a very, very private uh, burial service. I wouldn't even call it a funeral. It was a burial service. And uh, he, he literally, and my brothers and sisters were there, and he literally looked at me and said, you know, Pat Jr., I want to thank you and, and your siblings for sharing your dad with us because he was a dad to us too. And uh, I just thought that was, that was really cool and, and – uh, and of course, I was super happy to share dad with, like I said, the thousands of young men that 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 played for him. And, and if for no other reason, just because of all the hard work and dedication and sacrifice they made to play for him. Yeah. Well, you, you know, it's it's a great point. You talk about guys hanging on every word and and, uh, you know, I don't want to make this, you know, about, uh, about my dad. But it's something that if you, if you knew who my dad was, Kurt Crane, he was never intimidated by anybody. I, and I was the oldest, uh, kind of similar to what, you know, you're talking about. And I remember going with my dad to see your dad, to see Pat die. And, and I'd seen my dad in a lot of situations and he was always tough. He was always the, the alpha of the situation, really. He was always under control and, and how he felt, you know, he was managing situations. But when, when we would go see your dad, he would not say a word. It was, yes, sir, everything. I never saw him. That's the only person in my life that I saw when they would meet, he would see him. And, and starstruck, I don't think is the word, but just the level of respect between him and how every he hung on every word that your dad said. And again, like I said, it was almost like a funnel, you know, from the things that he was taught to me, because what I, I he used to say, the thing, the main thing that Coach Dye taught us is he used to say, you know, we don't get you up in the morning, you know, running you and doing this and, and puking you. I, I, and, and uh, we had an interview with Al Del Greco and talking about the puke buckets and stuff like that because I like doing it or just because you're winning football games. It's because when you have a, a wife and, and kids and a you know, mortgage payment and electricity payment and a car payment and, and it's tough and you may have just lost your job and, or, or you got a tough job that you don't like, but you have to do it to support the people you love, that when that alarm clock rings at six in the morning, you're going to get them to go to work because that's what you were taught to do. And I think that's something that all the guys that played for your dad really took. And I think he really took a society or he helped society by doing that. And I think we're missing some of that 
nowadays. And, and can you just talk about that work ethic that he distilled, not only his players, but I mean, look at the success that you've had because you haven't had all success because you're Pat Dye's son. Obviously, it helps to have somebody who knows you have worked your ass off, excuse my language, to get where you are going and to be at the top of your profession. I know that's something you reach back on all the time and think about those lessons your dad taught you. Yeah. Well, I would start by saying this. I mean, as old as, as, as long as I can remember, you know, old enough to even have a memory, I was working around the house. Um, yeah. as, as, I, as soon as I got old enough to push a lawnmower, I was mowing the lawn. <laughs> trimming hedges, picking up yeah. uh, hedge trimmings, uh, raking leaves, cleaning out dog pens, washing bass boats, washing cars, all this stuff. And I'll never forget, I mean, we would, dad wouldn't let me leave the house on Saturdays. This is not during football season. This is, this is during the off season. Wouldn't let me leave the house on Saturdays until noon because we would get up at daylight wow. and work until noon in the yard doing whatever needed to be done. And you know, all my friends would be down the street playing and I'd finally get there and like, where you been? I said, man, I've been cleaning up dog pens, this and that. <laughs> He's like, they're like, what does your dad pay you for that? And I'm like, pay, pay <laughs> let's, me let's that. me live here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Pay me for that. And then he said, well, I said nothing. And then they go, well, what, what's your allowance? I said, I don't have an allowance. And, you know, I, every once in a while I'd ask dad about, hey, you know, my friends get paid to do these things. He said, boy, I'm putting, <laughs> putting a roof over your head and food yeah. on your plate. And that's all he needed to say to me. So when I was 12, he went out and made me literally sign a bank loan to buy a riding lawnmower and start a landscape service in our in our, our neighborhood. This was in, in Greenville when he was at East Carolina. And then I think when I turned 14, he uh, and I was really into golf and I was into football as well, but I was playing competitive golf. And, you know, my big summer tournament schedule was during the summer. Well, he's like, no, um, you're going to work in the tobacco fields at 14 wow. years old. So I'm in the tobacco fields from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. every day, Friday through Saturday, Friday through Sunday. I mean, I'm sorry, Monday through Friday. Wow. And then on Saturdays, I would work from 6 a.m. till noon. And so, you know, I think that's 66 hours or so. Of work. And my take home after taxes was about $68 for 66 hours of, of work. And Jeez. I'm talking 110 degrees in Eastern North Carolina, yeah. humid. I'd come home covered from head to toe from the tar, from you know, picking the tobacco and hanging it in these barns. And, and I did that from the time I was 14 until I graduated from high school. And, um, and I, I asked him many times, my like, dad, why are you making me do this? And he said, well, I grew up in, working in a cotton field um, and it taught me great life lessons and, and all those things. And he said, trust me, one day you'll be glad you did it. One day you'll be bragging on it. And here I am bragging. <laughs> but, um, I, you know, I get to Auburn. He makes me get a full time job. He said, you're making enough money to pay your way through Auburn. And I was like, dad, you're the head coach. coach. Said, wow. I don't, I don't care. You pay your way. So I paid my way through Auburn. I paid my way through law school at Sanford at Cumberland. Um, I had to take out student wow. loans to do that. And this all the while he's the head coach at Auburn. And huh. um, so he instilled the same kind of work ethic in me as a son as he instilled in his players. And, and you know, you commented on some of the things and, and talking about what your dad, you know, has taught you and a lot of it flowing from my dad. I mean, dad's feeling was the things he was teaching and preaching to his players not only helped them prepare to be better football player, players and a better team, but it also prepared them to be better people and better yes. men and better husbands and better fathers and better siblings and better sons and better members of society. He felt like those things paralleled, mm -hmm. um, teaching those characteristics and, you know, again, the hard work, the discipline, the commitment, the passion, the selflessness, being a team player, all those things. He felt like he instilled those things again. It was going to make them better players and better, better men. Um, so. No, that that's unbelievable. I didn't know that. I mean, having to, you know, paying your way through school while your dad's the head coach, you may be the only guy that ever had to do that in the history of the world. But again, like you said, it's something you look back on now. And, and I look back on and think about the things that were said to me that really helps. But I, I got to ask you too, uh, looking at it and, and, and going forward now, 
uh, with what you're doing in the sports agency business. And I want to get to that. But when he went to Auburn, can you talk about the transition of going to Auburn to become the head coach? Uh, he totally changed everything, changed the culture there. What was it like for you going to Auburn and that experience, especially the first couple of years when he was trying to get everything right? Because you remember those interviews and, you know, against, you know, Alabama saying, you know, I take my hat off to Coach Bryant, love the guy or whatever. But when we have the same amount of cards in the deck, we're going to be doing a little bit of celebrating too. Yeah, yeah. So a um, little bit of a backstory. I was actually a freshman at Georgia when Dad was in wow. head coach at Auburn. And in fact, if I went back even further, I was a freshman at Georgia fall of 1980 when they won the national championship Herschel's freshman year. Well, yeah. I, I don't – some of your viewers will probably remember Coach Dooley graduated from Auburn. Yes. Uh, Fob James was the governor, governor of the state of Alabama – Bob James and Coach Dooley were roommates at Auburn. So Auburn made a run at Coach Dooley. Yeah. And Coach Dooley, I mean, that thing was well down the tracks for him to come to Auburn. Well, I'm a freshman at Georgia. And word is, if Coach Dooley goes to Auburn, Georgia's going to hire my dad to be the head coach at Georgia. I'm like, wow, this is unbelievable. <laughs> you know, I have it all figured out. Yeah. Well, long story short, Coach Dooley ends up staying at, at, at Auburn. I mean, at Georgia. They then offer the job to Coach Bowden. Uh, who, who had just gotten things rolling at Florida State, he turned it down. So my dad interviewed twice and was their third choice and ultimately ultimately got the job. So I'm a freshman at Georgia, and I'm sitting there going, you know, this isn't going to be fair to my dad to be at Georgia when he's competing and recruiting yeah. at Georgia every day when you wake up being the head coach. Yeah, Auburn. yeah. So I decided to transfer to Auburn sight unseen. Hadn't seen the campus, and frankly – having grown up in Tuscaloosa for nine years and, and with Coach <laughs> Bryant and then being, being at Georgia, both schools did not like Auburn. Both schools talked down about Auburn. And so even with very low expectations, I decided to transfer, you know, to, to Auburn again, sight unseen. So I'm going to say it's January or February of my freshman year. I'd made a decision to transfer. I drive from Athens to Auburn and I get off the interstate um, there on airport boulevard and at that point in time i know a lot of your your listeners or viewers what have you are, are too young to remember airport boulevard being a two-lane road well it was a two-lane road and i get off and it's probably i don't know four or five mile stretch till you get to 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 college street or whatever and it just struck me the sides of the road we're just littered with trash. I get to College Street. I take a left. And, you know, at that point in time, yeah, College Street was was quaint. You go by Sanford Hall, the you know, the big iconic building there. And then dad was staying um, because they, they didn't have a house. They were staying at it, uh, what was then called the University uh, Hotel and uh, conference center and it was nothing like the university hotel there now across from the library which is was actually very nice this place was was kind of run down it's down by the interstate and i'm like good lord what in the hell have i got myself into? <laughs> and more importantly what has my dad got himself into <laughs> so i fast forward i transfer and i'm just like i quickly learned that you know, and I say this with all due respect to people that went to Auburn, you know, from the day it opened its doors back in the 1800s, all, you know, through the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, yeah. 70s, whatever. I say this with all due respect. When I got to Auburn, and frankly, when my dad got to Auburn, it was a dump, okay? It was a great school, but the facilities, particularly athletic facilities, were run down. The coach, football coaches were sharing these offices two in an office about the size of a phone booth in the basketball, really? in the basketball coliseum okay we had to walk out of the basketball coliseum across the road to go to football practice that football building wasn't <laughs> there no it wasn't kidding? there and um the athletic department was 15 million dollars in the red um auburn was over in the scc the year before dad got there i mean literally did not win an scc game got beat 41 42 to nothing at homecoming by Tennessee at home Jeez. um I mean it was just awful and on top of all that it's 1981 
Alabama won the national championship in 79. Georgia won it in 80. Yeah. And you're coming in there with Coach Bryant in, his, in the height of his success, Coach Dooley, and three more years of Herschel Walker, and you're sandwiched between those two and waking up and having to recruit against Alabama in the state, having to recruit against Georgia, which you've always had to recruit hard, the state of Georgia hard when you're at Auburn. I'm like, Dad, this is professional suicide. So I literally, I mean, it was against all odds. And, you know, he starts with spring practice in 81 and literally a third of the team quit. Yeah. I mean, just, you know, you got the, the famous Bud Casey video and picture of him with blood running down his head because he just head butted with George Peoples and yeah. blood, blood, on, blood on the saddle and this and that. And, <sighs> and it, it was just, it was crazy. Yeah. And, and he told him before they started, he said, I know you didn't come to Auburn because of me. You know, I, I hope you came to Auburn because you love Auburn. And, and I hope you love football. And, and those that you want, want to stay, I welcome you here. Those that you don't want to stay or can't tough it out, whatever, it's probably not best that you be here. Yeah. And um, so he did. He stripped it down. He boiled it down. And, you know, they went out that first year. And, and you know, they were pretty competitive. I'm not looking at the schedule right now, but they were pretty competitive. Mm -hmm. We're up on Alabama against Coach Bryant in this 315 game where he broke Amos Alonzo Stack's record and, and Alabama ends up coming back. But, you know, Dad told Coach Bryant, you know, on the field before that first game, he said, we, we ain't afraid, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and then the following, you know, we signed Bo during that offseason after the first year. And we're, we were having a great season, 82, Bo's freshman year, and just lost to number one ranked Al uh, George at home and getting ready to play Alabama. And, it, you know, the old story about Bo going to the bus stop and was trying to go home and quit. And, um, Coach Casey got wind of it. Coach Casey calls dad and dad says, go get him, bring him to my office. And they sat down and talked. And I mean, this is well documented. I'm not telling the world anything they don't know, but dad just told him, he's like, look, you, you do what you want to do. I, I can't make you do anything. But he said, for the first time in a long, long time, you give Auburn people hope against Alabama. Wow. And so Bo ends up staying and, and um, you know, we come back that next week and, and break the drought, hadn't beaten Alabama in, in nine years and uh, beat them 23-22. And obviously, Bo was a, very instrumental in that. And uh, and that was kind of, you know, that was kind of a launching pad. That team went nine and three. The, the 83 mm -hmm. team went 11 and one, won the first SEC championship in, I guess, 30-some years in, this, in in school history. And, and, you know, if I had to kind of just encapsulize you know, there are a few things I'd say about dad and the impact that he made. But think about the fact that Auburn had been playing football for pretty much 100 years when dad got there. 100 years. Yeah. They had won one SEC championship in the history of the school in 1957. He won four. And two of his best teams were the 84 and 85 teams with Bo, and we were preseason number one both of those years. Bo got hurt in 84. He was dinged up in 85. We ended up losing four games in both those seasons, I think. And, and uh, it's, but, you know, the idea that he won four SEC championships in eight years when they'd won one in the history of the school and, and just, you know, he, he raised the money to build that football building. He raised the money to enlarge the, the stadium. And, and what happened was when we started winning, and we started beating Alabama. And I'm not saying every year, but being competitive, well, all, of, all of a sudden, Auburn became a cool place to go. Yeah. So, so applications, applications to go to Auburn went through the roof. So the quality of the student body went through the roof. And then he gets that game moved to Auburn. And the Auburn-Alabama game moves that to Auburn in 89. And you look at what it's done for the infrastructure. I go back to that two-lane low road that was littered with trash yeah and i got there in 1981 and now you go to that place and it's four lanes every which way to you know to the interstate and the buildings the city um the campus uh the facilities um and you know i i don't have the exact records but i've looked at this i think it was it's been 40 you know 40, 40 ish years since dad came to Auburn. If you looked at the 40 years prior to him coming to Auburn and looked at the record against Alabama, it was abysmal. 
you look at the record since he got there, which is the last 40 or so years, it's pretty much even. It's unbelievable. And, and, and you're talking about during that stretch of time, no doubt, over those 40 years, arguably the best college football program in the history of college football. Uh, particularly when you incorporate what, what Coach Saban's done there for the yeah, last what, 10, 10, 11, 12 years. And um, so, you know, moving that game to Auburn, which was very unpopular at the time, and state legislature was against it, the city of Birmingham was against it, Alabama was <laughs> against it. Yeah. And I, I did a thing at Jimmy Rain's, they were on, on her dad at Jimmy Rain's charity event two years ago, and I started talking about that. And there were a lot of Alabama people in the crowd. Um, I said, would any of y'all that would like for the game to go back to Legion Field and be played there every year, <laughs> raise your hand? Not a single hand went up. It's amazing. It's done amazing things for, for Auburn's campus, Auburn's fundraising, Auburn's ticket sales, Auburn's suite sales. And it's done amazing things for Alabama's ticket sales, infrastructure, yeah. suite sales, all of that. And, uh, and I'm, of all the things that he did for Auburn, that truly bringing that game there, what it did for the state and the two top institutions in the state, you know, might be his greatest legacy. Uh, without a doubt. And it did nothing but enhance what is the greatest rivalry in sports in any sport. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll die on that hill. Uh, you can have Michigan, you can have Ohio State, uh, whatever. It's it, At the end of the day, we know we know the one that means the most because you got to look the other guy in the eye that lives right across the street. And real quick before we move on, I do got to say something about one of our newest sponsors, eBay. Uh, we're looking for old shoes, new shoes, whatever kind. They've got everything. We all know how, how great this selection is on eBay. Head over to ebay.com slash sneakers. Get you a pair because they have a team full of authenticators. They're looking at everything, the box, the logo, running through every tread on the shoe to make sure it's exactly what you wanted, exactly what you ordered. Uh, and at the end of the day, that's exactly what you want from a trusted source like eBay. So make sure you head over to ebay.com slash sneakers and go ahead and cop the pair that you've wanted. But uh, I do got to ask you, Pat, because I want to get to what you've done in the sports stage because it's been incredible the way you've been able to take it. But I do, when, when your dad passed, and then obviously it was somewhat recently, can you just talk about the outpouring of support and just, you know, and I'm trying to hold it together over here, to be honest with you, but just what did that mean to you? Yeah, well, it was, it was, um, <clears throat> you know, the good thing for me in, in terms of processing, you know, dad's death is it was not a, it wasn't a sudden thing. I mean, he, yeah. had, he had had kidney issues going back to, you know, at least a year before. And I mean, he was, he was definitely on the decline physically. There's no doubt. And, you know, that 80th year is a real medical mile marker, which I've, I've learned. And um, I'll go back to literally his 80th birthday. Um, you know, he, we were, I was going, I was going to drive to Auburn and just, just take him to a really nice dinner, just the two of us and, and, yeah. and catch up. And literally the morning of his birthday, he calls my assistant and says, tell Pat not to come. And she said, why? She said, he's, he said, I'm, I'm going, to, I've got to go to the hospital and running a fever and yeah. all this stuff. And it was all kidney related. And, and I was like, when she told me that, I said, are you kidding me? That's all the more reason I'm going to go. Yeah. So I, um, I literally, I drive from Atlanta to Auburn and stopped and picked up a couple of steaks to go and <laughs> took him to his hospital room. And man, we sat there it must have been four or five hours just talking about life, football. Hmm. It was just, it was, and when I look back and know now that he's gone, I mean, I wouldn't take anything in the world for that night. And I went back the next day and saw him and took him a barbecue sandwich and, <laughs> and all this. And then I saw him, you know, multiple times leading up to, you know, I guess April, um, he, he had to go in the hospital again, for kidney issues, running a fever and all this stuff. And he was there. God, he called me the first night he was there. And I was like, man, he sounds awful. I mean, I've, I've never heard him sound so defeated and just, I mean, it was almost like, man, it's my time to go. I don't want to live like this, you know? And yeah, but they got him regulated. And every day I talked to him, his voice got better. His energy got better. So he got out on a Friday. And, and this is in the height of COVID. Everybody in the hospital seemed like was in there for COVID. He was in yeah. there for his kidney stuff. So he gets out on Friday and I'm like, 
I'm going to see him while I can because I couldn't go see him in the hospital. Yeah, with the with COVID, COVID stuff. Yeah, because of all Man. the restrictions. So if I'm going to see him, it's going to be outside the hospital. So I uh, I grabbed my kids and and um, you know I got divorced June of 18 and I you know I called my ex wife who was close to him and he thought of like a daughter and she didn't really have a dad and so I grabbed her and, and my two kids and we rode to Auburn the first morning after he got out. He got out Friday afternoon. We went down there Saturday. It was just an incredible, beautiful spring day. And man, he had his energy and he's like, told his, his gal out there, you know, grab the golf cart. I want to drive them around and show <laughs> them my, my recent projects. I mean, this guy just got out of the hospital the day before. Tough as nails, had, man. Yeah. And um, at this point, uh, the board had called me and said, hey, we're, we're going to erect a statue of your dad outside the stadium, and we want to get this thing done while he's still around. And, you know, we want you and your dad to kind of pick out the picture or pictures that you want us to use in terms of molding the statue and creating mm -hmm. the statue. So I took those pictures down there, and I've got pictures of me and dad sitting there looking at these pictures. <laughs> you know, That's awesome. And, and so we had three or four hours with with me and my kids and we rode around his place and dad was just talking about life and the importance of family. And he was so thankful and very emotional and, but it was just an awesome day. And that really was the last time I saw him. Um, yeah. He, that was a Saturday, three days later, he's running a fever, goes back in the hospital. They test him for COVID. Sure enough, he tested positive for COVID. So yeah. he got it while he was in the hospital for the kidney things. Yeah. And um, so it's Memorial Day weekend. I get a call from his girlfriend and, and she said, Pat, the doctor said, if you want to go see him, you need to go now. Yeah. And I'm like, how are they going to let me in? She said, we've pulled special strings, whatever. So I went to the hospital and man, they outfitted me in a freaking hazmat outfit. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I was, it was, a, you know, full on suit, mask face shield, gloves, booties, everything. And I walked in there. He was, he was in pain. Um, and I had this, I mean, I, I cried. The, I was at, I was at Lake Martin when I got the call. It's Memorial Day yeah. weekend. I cried the whole way from Lake Martin to the hospital. Ugh. Obviously cried when I got there. Um, you know, told him everything I wanted to tell him. I hope he heard it. He did, man. He did. Um, but, I left there with peace. Take your time. Take your time. Yeah, take your time. You, you know we heard you. You know. There's no doubt. So <clears throat> I left there with peace about two things. Number one. Um, I didn't want to see him that way. Yeah. <clears throat> and I know he didn't want to live that way. Well, I mean, Pat, you know, it's something, y'all got that Saturday, you know, when he got to sit with you and look at those pictures of that statue. And, you know, you talk about all the, the lives that were affected and, and I totally understand, you know, and it, it's amazing. It's something where I'm sure the memories that you have of him, you know, even though you went and saw him in the hazmat suit, I mean, you know, those are ones that, that you'll have forever. And I'm sure the good times, you know what I'm saying, are, are always in the forefront, you know? Yeah. So I, I, like I said, I left there with peace that, that um, I didn't want to see him that way. He didn't want to live that way. Yeah. And I knew when I walked out of the there, <clears throat> it was the last time I'd seen. And yeah. so I immediately had peace when I got word that, yeah. that he had passed. And I'll share a really, really cool story with you. Yeah, please do. Please do. Um, and I appreciate this, Pat Art. And I know our audience, I really appreciate it. I know this is tough. I know, shoot, it's tough for me. I can only imagine what it is for you. You know what's funny? Because I've done probably a hundred interviews 
since he passed, radio interviews, television interviews, podcasts, whatever, and I've held it together pretty well. <laughs> talking to you is a little bit like family. It is. You know that forever. Um, so, anyways, um, I went in there. Went in there Sunday of Memorial Day weekend, and on, I guess it'd be eight days later on a Monday. Um, I get a call, <clears throat> probably 11.45 a.m. Eastern from his girlfriend that he had just passed. So he didn't want to be embalmed. He wanted to be buried under this tree. Oh, yeah. Hell, yeah. On his, on his farm. So <clears throat> I get to the farm where everybody was gathering, and... Take your time, Pat. Take your time. And we've we've heard that story about that wanting to be under that tree, and just shows you, you know, that's the most Pat Dot thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> yeah. Well, he he wanted one more one more ride down his down his dirt road. Oh yeah. So they put his coffin in a wagon and had his had his horses draw the wagon to the burial site. But really cool story. So I get there where everybody's gathered. I apologize. No, Pat, don't, don't apologize at all. And everybody that knows understands. Everybody that knows understands. You take your time. You've got all the time in the world. So one of the first people I see when I walk in the room, and this is at the lodge at the farm, and like I said, it was, it was a small very small gathers, pretty much family and a few former players, former coaches. And um, one of the first people I see is Bo. Yeah. And he tells me the story. He says, Nancy, my girl's, my dad's girlfriend, called Bo the morning dad passed and said, hey, if you want to talk to Coach Dye, you need to call him now. Yeah. So literally, you'd call the room and the nurse would... Put the phone on speaker. Yeah, yeah. And dad was just laying there. He couldn't talk. I called him at 1140 Eastern. Mm -hmm. They hung up. Dad passed away five minutes later. Really? So that's the, that's the last conversation. How was it, Bo Jackson? The last person he spoke to on this planet was Bo. That's amazing. So and it was almost like. Sounds like fate to me, Pat. So, it was like he hadn't talked to him before he went. Yeah. yeah. So. Anyway. That's incredible. That's incredible. I, I really appreciate you sharing that, Pat. I know it's yeah, tough. Yeah, man. And I know it's tough. People, not many people know that. And I didn't know it. Frankly. Yeah. No, Bo told me. But um, but it was cool. I mean, it was a great service. It was the way Dad wanted. The weather was yeah. great. We did it right about sunset. And uh, just so you know who my dad was, I mean, I picked out the pallbearers. There were six of them. Five of them were black. Wow. Yeah, it was Bo, Rodney Garner, Joe Witt, Craig Ogletree, and Chico. Wow. Who worked on his farm for 27 years. And then and, and Jimmy Rain was the only white guy. <laughs> but that's who dad was. He didn't see color. Yeah. No. Um, did not see color. And and I think that's another reason, you know, when you consider the fact that the predominance of his team was were probably black players. 
and the fact that he could again get Bo Jackson, who grew up in a rough area of Bessemer, <laughs> yeah. to mesh and meld with Randy <laughs> Campbell, who grew up in Parcel, <laughs> North Alabama. Yeah, you know, and and, and mesh those guys. I mean, I, th I think it's he had he was very unique in that way. And yeah, uh, you know, I'm proud. Dad signed the first black player to ever play at Alabama, which when you consider University of Alabama and all the civil rights and all that, the fact that dad was the one that signed the first black player yeah. to, to play at Alabama, something, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of. So, yeah. but anyways, the service was great. Um, you know, it, but just so fitting of dad. I mean, there weren't many people there. Mm -hmm. I hired a bagpiper to come out of it from the <laughs> to, to play. And, um, you know, we, we didn't have a, even have a PA system and we were having to socially distance because of COVID. And, but, uh, but we had a, we had a great send off and you know, so anytime, awesome. anytime I'm in the area, I, I go out to the farm and see his, his grave site, burial site, whatever yeah. it is. It's under a live oak that is a, um, a clone off of, uh, you know, one of the oaks at, at Tumor's Corner. That's so, so unbelievable. And, and it's just so fitting. And you talk about being able to, to you know, look at everybody the same and, and treat everybody the same, and and that's why you know not only from the football side and the wins and stuff like that, more the stuff I heard about Pat Dye had nothing to do with football, and I don't, I don't think a lot of people know that, and I don't think a lot of people realize that he was the first guy to sign an African American player at Alabama, and that was him. And and Pat, uh, like I said, I really appreciate you sharing that, man. I know it's tough, and I, I want to ask you about you know what you're doing Jay, now. Let me, let go me, ahead, let go me, ahead. I, I never, I never actually got to the point of your whole oh question. go ahead no you go 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 sorry, go you go sorry shut sorry up. for the sorry for the lead up no um, you're good you're good but i i feel like that was pretty pretty poignant moment we just it shared was, there. that was um that was real so you you referenced and asked about the the outpouring of yeah. support and so you know this first 24 hours you just it's adrenaline it's planning it's who to who to invite and and i mean literally you know, I don't know who broke the news first, whether it's ESPN's crawl or, or, or what, but I swear to you, within 15 minutes of word getting out, my cell phone was going off like a slot machine in Vegas. I mean, it was every five to 10 seconds, text from friends, former players, my clients, you know, Kirby Smart, Coach Saban, Coach Jeremy Pruitt, um, I mean, you just, you name them, Ozzy Newsome. Yeah. Uh, and then there was one I got from a, a 215 area code. I didn't have the number in my phone. And the text says, um, Pat, I've always admired and respected your, or always had great respect and admiration for your dad as a, as a coach um, and as a man. And he said, you know, I've known of him since I was, I was a junior on the 1980 BYU team when we had Jim McMahon. No and your dad, way. Your dad was the head coach at Wyoming for that one year before he came to came to Auburn. And, and he goes, we won in a 56-49 shootout. But he said, ever since then, I've just had great respect for your dad and the way he prepares players and men, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I got no idea who this is at the <laughs> bottom of it. At the bottom of it, Andy Reid. Are who you had, kidding? Who had just – three months, four months earlier, had just won, you know, his first Super Bowl. And, uh, but, you know, Andy had the 215 number because he'd been, you know, yeah. with the Eagles. That's uh, incredible, Pat. Yeah. So, man, it's, it's, I mean, literally when I tell you not hundreds of texts, letters, emails, whatever, I'm talking thousands. Um, so all that support did two things. One, it was very uplifting. And two, it kept me so damn busy trying to <laughs> respond, to respond to them all to email them back to text them back to call yeah. them back whatever you know it really kept me preoccupied those first several days you know after dad passed and I, I swear to you swear to you today is the most emotional I've been since dad passed and and I think it's partly because you know your dad was my first client your dad yeah. played for my dad you're like family to me and just something struck me. It's like, God dang, you know, here we go. Well, it's real. It's um, real. It's real. Yeah. Well, I promise you it wasn't contrived. And oh, frankly, no, it's, um, frankly, it's a little, a little embarrassing, but no, you know, heck no, Pat, don't, yeah. don't look everybody that knows. And this is, this is what I say. If you had any sort and, and so many people do it to me, it's the biggest compliment 
that you can get when you when you pass, when they put you in the ground, you have that outpouring of support, the people that you affected and the lives that you touched. And it, it is because, again, you know, what my dad and your dad went through and, and we were able to see, you know, with our eyes, I was able to see his reaction to him. Like I talked earlier, that's something that you don't get a lot of those in life. You don't get a lot of those people. There's very rarely does someone come along that is able to do and, and shape people in a way that, and it wasn't for any personal gain for, for your dad. It was because he cared about what happened to the guys that, that cared about him and that the ones that he cared for. And that I know, uh, and, and again, it's, uh, I know it's tough for you to talk about. And I really, really appreciate you. I know our audience really appreciates, you know, the genuineness and the stories that, that they, some of them haven't got to hear, but there is no embarrassment at, at all. And, and sh none should be felt because it is that type of situation. It is emotional. You know, we've all, everybody riding in the car right now or watching on YouTube, you've lost somebody that, that you love that have been close to you. And it's one of the most traumatic things you can. And when you have somebody that's a figure like your dad was, and you talk about the phone jumping off the hook, almost spontaneously combusting. To me, to me, that says more about a person than any score, any touchdown, bow going over the top, whatever. And uh, I just think, you know, I hope that, you know, when I pass, that it's even a, a tenth of what your dad did. Because again, he changed people's lives. He took people that were in situations that especially back then, other people probably would have looked the other way and transformed their lives and gave them a chance to give their kids something they never had. And that's the goal, right? That's the whole reason we're here, to leave it better than we found it, to give our children and, and the younger people a better place. And there's no better person that nobody's perfect that everybody makes mistakes. Somebody's perfect, but your dad was damn close. He was yeah. damn close. And, and I do, and I know our audience really appreciates that. And I know I keep saying that, but you know, you're, you're not going to hear this from anybody else other than, than the son, than the guy, like you said, that got in the car the, for that hour and a half to go there and that hour and a half back. And I know you look back on those and you guys have so many great memories and, and it's just awesome to hear, uh, you know, that it, it was exactly the way that he would have wanted it, man. That's, that's amazing stuff. And, and Pat, you talk about my dad being your first client. And, and as we wind down here, and, and like I said, I just, I, I can't thank you enough for your time, especially this time of year. I know how crazy it is for you. But can you talk about you getting into the agency, signing your fees for you guys? Because me and you talked on the phone the other day, and I thought it was just an incredible story uh, about how you, you got in. And, and I think it does go back to working in those tobacco fields from six to six and from six to noon on Saturday. Do, do you think that's something that now when you're going out and signing guys and, and having these conversations and get these guys prepared, because that's what your job is, obviously, to sign them, but prepare them and take care of them and protect them and be able to help set their families up. It's funny how those things kind of correlate. Your dad did it through coaching. You're doing it through your deal because there are a lot of similarities in how you're helping not only the person, but the family and the circumstance. Well, frankly, that's why I went in the business because I had grown up, you know, again, from the time I was old enough to remember or have a, a memory watching guys like your dad work their ass off and yeah. sacrifice themselves physically, emotionally, all the sacrifice the family's made you know, the blood, sweat, and tears. And, and back when your dad was playing for my dad, dad had four days. There was no 20 hour rule. And, yeah. you know, so in seeing the injuries, I saw how fleeting success could be in the game of football and it's a violent sport. And I went into it because I was tired of seeing players taken advantage of by unscrupulous, unregulated yes agents and sometimes they were also incompetent which is a really bad combination you know you're dishonest and incompetent yeah um and and seeing guys and as i was old getting older teenage years you know and certainly in college these guys were friends of mine i mean your dad and i drank a lot of beer together yeah as, as, you know i mean yeah really, before yeah. i ever before i ever started recruiting him and and you know we deer hunted together and same with th same thing with stacy searles who was also in your dad's yeah. class yeah you know, your dad and Stacy were, and Jeff Berger were my first three clients. And your That's dad literally, your dad literally was the first one, you know, to commit to me. And uh, good Lord, I, I, I can remember when your mom was pregnant with you. Oh. Um, that's how far we go, <laughs> we, we go back. But oh, yeah. yeah, so there are, there are, there are a ton of parallels uh, in what my dad did and the way he impacted those lives and, and what I do now. 
in impacting lives and, and protecting these guys from all the vultures out there, whether it's bad agents, bad financial people, bad females, bad relatives or people that aren't relatives, but call themselves relatives, bad friends. Yeah. Um, I mean, these guys are, they are a target. They got a bullseye on their back and, you know, so we're super protective. And, and again, having grown up and going into some of the homes that dad went into, whether it was at Alabama or East Carolina or Auburn and, you know, impoverished neighborhoods, impoverished communities, whatever, and seeing where, you know, some of his players came from and seeing where a lot of my clients came from, the sense of responsibility yeah. to make sure they capitalize on this very unique opportunity to get out and to be able to get their families out and to be able yeah. to take care of themselves, their kids and their kids' kids, you know, if mm -hmm. they take care of their money, which we, you know, start preaching from, from day one. And, and frankly, dad and I would talk every Monday um, during the football season. And the first topic would be the Auburn game. He'd want to talk about that. Um, yeah. you know, and he, yeah. <laughs> he'd, he'd go over there and watch, he'd go over and watch tape with Rodney Garner on Sunday mornings and, all this stuff. Sometimes he'd beat Rodney to the office, you know, they'd get back to <laughs> fricking college station at three or four in the morning and dad would be over there at six 30. <laughs> He's like, coach, I'm trying to get a couple hours <laughs> sleep here. But we, we talk about the Auburn game. We might talk a little bit about, you know, other SEC games. And then we would shift to talking about how my clients had played on Sunday. He and I both like to talk, yeah. but it was a really, really cool bond to be able to talk about something we were both super passionate about, which is the sport of football and also people and taking yeah. care of people. So, yeah. Well, well, like I said, it's amazing the correlation kind of how those two overarching things uh, you two have in common and being able to discuss that. I know you look back on that and really take a lot from it. And uh, Pat, uh, Pat Jr. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you coming on. I know you're super busy, like I said, especially this time of year and being able to share that. Cause I know there's a lot of people out in our audience uh, that knew nothing of, of some of those stories and being able to get even closer to a guy that everybody feels close to, regardless if they ever met him or not. And I think that's something that separated him as well. And just from the bottom of my heart, you know, I love you, man. And, and our family loves you. And, and, you know, I'm excited to be able to see you again. I know it's been a while, but uh, I just really do, you know, man to man, want to thank you for coming on and, and having the guts to share this stuff. And, and uh, I'm just very grateful for the opportunity to be able to, to talk to you about this. And again, it probably would have been the same conversation if this was just me and you on the phone. Uh, right. It probably happened the exact same way, but uh, I do. And I know our audience thanks you as well. Yeah. Well, look, I appreciate you having me on. And obviously it's great to see one of dad's former players, offspring having success, <laughs> proud, of, proud, proud of you. And, and, Again, just talking to you for the last hour, it's it's uncanny how much you remind me of your dad, and and you should be proud of that. He was he was a yeah. good man, really yeah. good man, and and I, uh, that. I certainly appreciate what he did for for my dad and 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 for my alma mater, you know, Auburn University. So, um, wish you the best of luck with your show, and uh, let me know anytime you want to you want want me to jump back on with you. Well, it's got to happen again, definitely, and 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 a lot more. And and again, like I said, thank you so much. Thanks, everybody out there for tuning in. Uh, it's been another edition of the J-Boy Show. Make sure you subscribe on our YouTube channel. Check us out on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, the fastest growing podcast in sports podcasts in the country, and we're going to keep doing it. It's been another edition of the J-Boy Show. J-Boy's going, going, gone. The J-Boy Show is produced by David Cohn, technical director Dave Hammock, creative director David Culbertson, audio engineer Faison, production assistant Kyle Orr, and our executive producers Jay Crane, Vince Thompson, and of course we film at Melt Sports in Atlanta, GA. So come check us out. <laughs>